Well, good afternoon, beloved Contramans, and welcome to class number eight. It's so good to be back together after our hiatus um, from classes throughout Lent and uh, Holy Week and the beginning of the Easter season, but here we are again. But before we get too far, first things first, coffee. Much, much better. So, today we continue in our stories of uh, the scriptures as we've been working through them. They function in some certain ways in our life. They do some things. I want you to write these down. Remember, there's four things that stories do. These should be at the top of our memory now. Ready? Stories communicate. They speak truth, they touch our emotions, and they work to build community. And of course, in our Lutheran tradition of faith, as we continue to say it, more often than not, we hear stories in worship together. It's one of the primary places where we hear the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Gospels, the Psalms, and respond to them then as God's people. And that response is always an act of interpretation. We're always trying to figure out what these stories mean and how they can impact our lives as followers of Jesus, as followers of Christ. And so we always are asking, what's the good news? And how might we then respond? And so we're going to recap. We're going to look all the way back now. If you remember, we've been through a lot together. Our first week way back in the uh, last fall was the story of creation. That we are made to be beautiful, wonderful, amazing, impactful, unforgettable masterpieces. We are created by God. God loves us. And we then can love too. And of course, the second week, the second story was the story of the flood, Genesis chapters 6 through 9, when God floods out all those things that are robbing the world of life. And then God decides that violence is not the answer and hangs up the war bow in the clouds, giving us the sign of the rainbow. Hmm. And then the third story, Abraham, Father Abraham, right? And his son Isaac, as God provides what is needed in a difficult circumstance, that ram in the thicket. Will we also look up for God's help in our difficult circumstances? And then story number four, deliverance of the Red Sea. This is Moses, one of the most famous stories of all of scripture, one of the most central um, to the understanding of Judaism. Um, when, when God delivers the people from Egyptian slavery, and as we remember then that God is still working to deliver people from modern day slaveries. And then we heard from prophet Isaiah in the fifth week and God's dream of abundance for the world. And when times are harder than we can imagine, right? When things are worse than they've ever been, God dreams about what could be and invites us to dream too of what could be possible in our suffering world. And then the sixth week, we talked about the epiphany of our Lord. We started telling stories of Jesus and how Jesus, how Christ's light draws all people, especially those magi, those mysterious figures from the East as the story goes, and how Christ's light illuminates all of our lives, showing us how to resist injustice, like King Herod was weighing over the people and how we can work then to make things right in the world. 
in class seven, our last class before Lent, we remembered the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his prophetic mission and how he brings good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, uh, release to the captives, all of that, bringing good news to people who know the hardest sides of life, even outsiders. And how might we then do the same? And so here we are, week eight, and we're going to be hearing about how Jesus gives the water of life. Here's the Bible I commonly read from at home. This is the same translation we use in worship, the New Revised Standard Version, NRSV. And in it, I'm going to turn to John's Gospel, John chapter 4. And we're going to hear a story that may be familiar to you. It's the story of Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman at the well. Hear now the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph in the ancient days. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks, as, seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. 
The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but, but no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. So there's a lot going on in this story. There's layers and layers of symbolism um, as this story has been crafted. And first of all, I think we should talk about the Samaritans and the Jews a little bit in their relationship, because that'll help us understand this story better. And, um, the thing is, the Samaritans and the Jews had once historically been one people, um, the people of God. Um, but they had split into two different kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And, and, and through the centuries, other superpower nations had come through their regions and and, and conquered their lands and, and moved some people out and moved some people back and, and a lot changed and a lot of their values changed and, and the temple was, um, was, uh, was in the southern kingdom and so the, those in the northern kingdom couldn't worship at the southern kingdom anymore so they worshiped on a mountain like we hear in the story today um, and, and there were five nations that ended up sweeping through Samaria Hence, we get this bit about Jesus saying, you've had five husbands. It's thought that that represents the five nations that swept through and that, that made life really hard for the people of God there. But even though these two groups became two kingdoms and two distinct peoples with very differing ideas about life and the world and faith and Messiah even, they still had that common ancestry that common bond of where they had originally come from. And Jacob was one of those ancestors that they shared. Jacob, whose well this was, where, where Jesus and this woman meet, where the whole scene takes place. And the well itself is symbolic because the well was a place where, where couples would meet, where families that were once divided would come and be married and, and join in relationship together. It was a place where bonds were formed. And so perhaps this meeting in today's story, this meeting at the well, reveals that past injustices, even a thousand years in the making, that God still somehow wants to find a way to make these things right. Which is also part of this living water that Jesus speaks of. And it's funny because water can be taken a few different ways. It can be taken very literally as it seems at first, right? Living water as in like a flowing stream, maybe a stream underground where you'd put a well. But it's clear that Jesus is using the phrase living water metaphorically here as a synonym for that spirit of God, that spirit that binds all of human life together. And so when he speaks of living water to this woman, he's applying it to the schism that she and he both represent, the Jewish people that he represents, the Samaritan people that she represents. 
And he speaks of a God who works to somehow repair these deep, deep rifts, these injustices, our sins, our our thousand-year-old patterns of abuse and neglect and reject, rejection and, and, and claims we might have of supposed superiority over other people groups. Jesus reminds us that we are of one shared humanity, one fabric of the human family, which may hold some good news for us now, even nearly 2,000 years after this story was first told. For we too have some schisms in our communities, some breaks in relationships, some injustices that we may need to address. Which is what our homework will focus on this week. And so we'll leave it there now, for now, beloved confirmands. But um, I want to look ahead for a minute. We only have a few more classes, video classes, this spring. And summer will be a nice period of downtime. Uh, There will be no requirements for confirmation class unless you're behind um, and are taking some time to catch up, which may very well be the case. It's perfectly fine. But I do look forward to hearing your insights from this story, from your homework that you gain together with your family this week. So I'll be keeping an eye out for those. The instructions are, of course, in the homework sheet, which was in the email, and should be posted in the link below this video on YouTube. So, until next time, beloved confirmants, Christ's peace be with you.